and the bricks and mortar that surround us. Just behind you there was where we all danced. Our streets chart momentous social change and the ebb and flow between enormous wealth and terrible poverty. Pretty grim, isn't it? Dirt, filth, stench everywhere. They reveal the changes that have shaped all our lives and make the story of our streets the story of us all. It's a nice view, isn't it? On the western edge of Edinburgh's 18th century Newtown is a street that has been home to Scotland's elite for 200 years. We had a cook and a maid, and that was it. Oh, and a nanny, yes. This is the story of Scotland's grandest street. Well, certainly, I remember as a child, you know, there were a few Rolls Royces about, um, but they were old Rolls Royces, you know. <laughs> Do you ever imagine what it must have been like when they would have balls in this room? Not really. No. No. The Murray Few, Edinburgh. A single development with the longest Georgian terrace in Europe. A crescent and an oval flowing into the grand circular Murray Place and known collectively as the Murray Few. Built as the home for Scotland's upper class, for 200 years it's been the poshest street in Scotland. My name is John Murray, I'm the 21st Earl of Murray, and my ancestor, the 10th Earl, built the Murray Estate in Edinburgh. This is the first Earl of Murray, who, yes. who is uh, uh, the son of James V. He does look a bit like you, do people say that? Uh, not too many people do. <laughs> Which bit? <laughs> When you walk down those streets in Edinburgh, it's your whole family on the street side. That's right. Murray is the county where we're mostly based. Stuart, Ainsley. That's Philip Ainsley there, the father-in-law of the 10th Earl. The 9th Earl or...? The 10th Earl. 10th Earl. Yes, that's him there, the 10th the, the Earl. Dune. <laughs> Monty Python the Holy Grail. It was filmed at Dune Castle. And Dune Castle is, of course, another family home. That's right. It is a good castle, actually. Mm. Me and my pals used to go down and watch them filming every day. Not big. When we're shooting, be nice if you use the rubber hammer, OK? Randolph. We didn't we, say we Randolph. We said Randolph, didn't no, we? Didn't. He is meant to have commanded the Scots at the Battle of Bannockburn. Another relative of yours. He was a... Well, he was, yes. We've still got that killed yes. somewhere in the attic. I think that's it, is it? Did you do Stuart? That's the family's surname. That's your uh, name? Yes. Oh, Glen Finlay Street, Finlay. and that was the old royal hunting forest that went with Dune Castle. Yes, I think we are. We're proud of it. So, um... It's <laughs> Freddie. 1810. The Edinburgh Council has plans for an extension to the medieval old town. On the other side of the valley, a new town is under construction. Luxury houses are shooting up along its ultra-modern grid-plan streets. And the developers rapidly hit the boundary of a country estate, owned by the 10th Earl of Murray. The Earl's house, Drumshuch, um, stood here. Randolph Crescent more or less follows the pattern of his drive. It was surrounded by parkland. All this was parkland. The nearest buildings were beyond Hanover Street, more than half a mile away from here. It was very much um, open country. By the early 1790s, Queen Street had reached its west end, and it kind of hit the buffers against um, the Earl's boundary. The Earl saw an opportunity. He drew up plans for an exclusive new development on his estate. The Murray estate it's too irregular to build squares on, but the layout of the crescents and circus fits ingeniously onto the contours of the land. The Earl of Murray was the feudal lord. Under medieval property law, he had the right to lay down strict regulations governing both the construction of the houses and the ways in which residents would live in them. All commercial use was forbidden. 
These viewing conditions were intended to apply for all time, even after the Earl had sold the land. They were amongst Britain's earliest planning regulations. It was said to be one of the strictest design codes there's ever been. They had to stick to the design code for the facades, get it absolutely right, exactly like their neighbour, exactly like every other house in the street. He actually stipulated which quarries the stone could come from. In the Edinburgh Old Town's medieval tenements, rich and poor had been living on top of each other, literally in the same buildings. The population huddled together within protective walls. Tenements rose, rich and poor lived cheek by jowl. But now the 10th Earl was using his viewing conditions to ensure that his development would be exclusive. By laying down eternal rules about the look of the buildings and the lifestyle of the residents, the Earl was building a planned community for Scotland's elite. A new town for the upper class. The new town was built to the requirements of only one section of the community. When the rich left the old town, society separated in a new way, and the division between slum and suburb began. When they moved to the Murray Estate, they knew they were moving into an upmarket residential area and that it was going to stay like that. It wasn't going to become mixed use. They weren't, weren't a cross-section of, of society, but it was pretty, pretty exclusive. A new social split resulted. For the first time, a complete environment was planned right from the beginning. They were snapped up by private individuals who were very keen to get onto the Murray Estate right from the beginning. People bought into the vision. The 1822 viewing plan shows the numbered plots ready for sale. Most are still unsold. The best, with views across the River Leith, have already been snapped up. And one upmarket family have put their builders to work. The head of the Scottish legal system, Solicitor General John Hope, and his dad, Lord Charles Hope, are at number 12. My name is David Hope. I'm a member of a family that has been connected with Murray Place really since it was built because one of my ancestors lived in a house that was built for him although my house now is just a few hundred yards to the east. What you can see here if you look out of the window is the back of Murray Place at the right hand end is number 12 which was um, a house lived in by um, two of my ancestors. I'm descended from Charles Hope's third son. But hold on, didn't he have the same job as you had? Charles did, yes, I, uh, that's right. He was Lord President and I was Lord President. 200 years apart? About that, yes, <laughs> yes. This is um, Charles Hope, who lived in uh, 12 Murray Place. That was me as Lord President in Scotland, and I, I then moved to the House of Lords. That's my favourite one. Oh, That's right. a much nicer well, one. <laughs> There's a very grand-looking outfit in this one. Well, that's the Order of the Thistle. You're a member of this one. Yes, oh, indeed. That's why, why yes, I wouldn't be allowed to wear it if I wasn't. <laughs> Who gave you this, this <laughs> honour? Her Majesty. Are you English? No. I have an accent which is actually uh, typical of my part of Edinburgh. I certainly don't regard myself as English, I'm very patriotic. There are times when it's lovely to be Scottish and not British. There are other times when I was very proud to be British. Lord Hope spent his early years at number 41 Murray Place. When he was still a boy, his expanding family moved to number 28, where, as a young man, he was introduced to the perfect girl next door but one. We had met in number 30. I was invited to a somebody's engagement party by the man, and you were invited to the engagement party by, by, the, girl. Uh, by the girl. And I have to say that their, <laughs> their, their relationship did not continue, <laughs> but ours did. <laughs> I remember when David was courting me, I remember going to a very riotous adult, I say, adult burn supper, in which we played murder in the dark, and I think we broke a chair and... <laughs> Various other things. <laughs> At number 28? At yes. number 28A, yes. 
28 was an enormous house which was probably built to the specification of Lord Murray himself. The Earl needed a townhouse to use when he was down from his estates in the north, and he reserved Murray Place's prime location to build it. The house was double fronted with six columns. At 11,000 square feet, it was by far the biggest house on the few. There, see? Why is this ceiling like this? Hmm? Where does the ceiling come from? Because this used to be the Earl of Murray's uh, living uh, floor. This must have been his living room. How many people live here? Here, me and him. How long have you lived here, Casey? God, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you, it must have been about 20, 30 years, something like that. It's when my husband retired. And he, because he was a Scot, I didn't have a home because I've lived everywhere. And he said he wanted to go home, so we came back here. That's how I finished up here. <laughs> Where's your husband now? In heaven. He died almost two years ago. And of course, that's why I have this place and I have had the will to get rid of it. <laughs> my mother's side, she was Dutch. My father was German. <coughs> but I don't belong to this room. What do you mean? <laughs> Only some of the stuff is mine. <coughs> What do you mean you don't belong? It's high class. The other residents had built their houses to conform with the conditions laid down by the Earl. Each house had five floors and was around 6,500 square feet, seven times the size of an average house today. The 152 houses took more than 30 years to complete, but when they were finished, one side of the few became the longest Georgian building in Europe and one of the greatest engineering feats of the 1850s. It is about a third of a mile long, in fact, it's more than a third of a mile long. One building built by umpteen different people over a long period of time. So this is the western end of the new town, uh, built in about 1840. And um, so all obviously the same architecture, same style. And so the reason I brought you to the front is that this level is where the owners would stop. So below was entirely for staff. The staff would have worked in the lower levels, mm. they would have lived on the top floor. Uh, it's just beyond that, so well, you can see the same level up there. Ah. Oh. It's that level. So it's under the eaves, basically. So you've got five floors. You've got people working, public rooms, uh, drawing room and, and family, then more bedrooms for you know, other kids or guests, and then staff uh, quarters. They are spectacular, but it's very hard to live in a five-story house if you, don't have, if you don't have people helping you, actually. You it's actually need staff. You do, really. But, I mean, you know, we don't, obviously, because we only live in three floors of it. But to live in five floors, um, you spend an awful lot of time getting up and downstairs, really. These enormous houses needed an army of servants to run them. The few's new households had between five and 12 domestic staff, most of them young women living under the same roof as their masters and mistresses. And while most women's options in life were limited to agricultural work, servants were cheap. And Lord Murray's design for living worked well. But as the First World War approached, millions of young women were switching to factory work, drawn by higher wages and unimagined new freedoms. A social revolution, which meant the upper class were having to make do with fewer domestic staff. Where are we, Patrick? 
Number nine. <laughs> I was born in number seven. <laughs> and then where did you move to? Well, moved to number nine. And then, then I was in London for a couple of years, and then I came back to, Ed to Edinburgh and lived in Murray Place. Oh, how far away is Murray Place from here? About 200 yards. <laughs> what are you doing now, Henrietta? Moving this out of the picture. It was Daddy's, and so I just kept it. In fact, when Patrick and I were married, he cut our cake with it. What year were you born here? 22. And what year did you move into Murray Place? 1944. Was uh, that no, right? no, 50, 54, 54. 54. And when did you leave? 98. <laughs> so you spent most of your life in, in, on the Murray Few? In the Murray Few, quite right, yes, indeed. And was it just your family in that house? Yes, indeed. And you had a cook, Ella, was it? No, that is three servants, yes. Well, you could tell them about it. At, at one time, at you one could time, tell them there were three that. servants there. Then it was, then it was just Jessie who was the, the only remaining one when the war broke, when war was ended. Was she the one who threw all the films away? Yes. Do you ever wish you could go back to the old days? Oh, well, literally. Sometimes, yes, sometimes. <laughs> My father died when I was six. And then we had a cook and a maid, and that was it. Oh, and a nanny, yes. Remember best of all the nanny who was with my mother for over 40 years. Uh, sorry, that was the cook, yes. The cook was, stayed all that time. She would produce breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, tea, I think we probably put together for ourselves. She must have had a day off a week, did she? Or two days off a week? Day off a week, yes. Not very much, is it? <laughs> My mother was quite a senior officer in the ATS. It was the women's army in the war and was allowed to retain the services of a servant. <laughs> what did your mother do for a living before the war? Oh, she just didn't. She was just a married woman, that was that. I don't think she ever had mm. a job. Before the war, women didn't work all that much. I mean, certainly middle-class people. She was particularly interested in, in horse riding. A friend of mine had number 29. When his uncle lived in it, which was not very long ago, he said in the 50s, he was master of the Linlithgow, I think it was, hunt. So he'd have his horse here, he'd get on his horse, ride it down to the station, put it on the train, or get on the train with it, and um, go out and hunt. And then his butler would have met him with a car, and he'd come back by car, and the butler would hack the horse back. So they genuinely did live like that. The new town housed a newly expanding middle class, now become genteel, investing money and making good profits on the development of canals and mills, and in the equipping and victualling of the Napoleonic Wars. Once the Union came along, that was an enormous advantage for Scottish businessmen. They got the advantage of being part of the UK, and particularly when colonies were developing abroad. So it was that sort of common market thing that was very, very important. This is 22 Murray Place, built in 1824. The first owner was a man called Walker Drummond, who was a lawyer. His widow sold it um, to the Primrose family, who were here for about another 50 years. Out here is um, Fekis College, which um, Bouverie Primrose was responsible for building, um, and he lived here, so obviously he was able to um, supervise the site uh, um, without leaving his house. Sir William Fekis endowed the school. I think it was about £180,000 it cost to build. Gross it up today, probably 30 million. Something like that. I suppose you describe him as a greengrocer by trade. He was a Mr. Tesco or Mr. Sainsbury of his time. Fetis gave the job of getting construction underway to Murray Place's Bouverie Primroses. This is the trowel used for laying the original foundation stone. The person who actually used it 
was the Honourable Mrs Primrose, wife of, of the Honourable Bouvery Primrose, one of the original trustees. I know that your school is known sometimes as the Eton mm. of Scotland. We take that as a compliment. I mean, the school at least has produced one Prime Minister. We sometimes refer to Eton as the Fetis of the South. And... Fetis College was founded in 1870, the start of a period of rapid expansion of the British Empire. By 1900, it covered an area of more than 11 million square miles. There was a vast enterprise to be run, and educated Scots embraced the opportunities. In the 19th century, two million Scots left their homeland to make a life abroad, and one third of all British colonial governors were Scottish. My father's a Scot. He was a tea planter, so I was born in India. I spent about the first seven years of my life there. We had an ayah, which is a nurse. They had um, somebody who cooked, and they had somebody who cleaned, and so on. And I spoke fluent Hindustani. I have a photograph of my tennis partner somewhere here. Um, there he is, Ramsbottom. Ramsbottom. But I'm sure it's Ram something or other, but he didn't mind being called Ramsbottom. He was lovely. <laughs> he was a really nice man. <laughs> My father's in the middle there with my mother. And that was on Christmas Day. They decided to send us to school, you know, um, here rather than there. They're enjoying themselves all right. Do you think I could meet one or two of them? Yes, certainly. Hilary. Hello, Hilary. I was just saying, Hello. I have met you, and yet I haven't. I've, I've met you, of course, in the film. Oh, yes. And you come from Manila. How's that? Oh, my father works out there. So he's sent us to boarding school, my sister and I. You've got a slight American accent. Is your father an American? No, he's Scottish, but I went to an American school in Manila. And your mother? My mother, she's English, born in Shanghai. This was given to us. We all have had one each to remind us of how they looked. Every three years we saw them, and they came back for six months, and then they had to go again. As the princess stepped ashore, the governor of the Windward Islands was there to meet her. And many of the people of Grenada had come to add their own greetings, formal and informal. This photograph is taken outside the town of Grenville in Grenada. And that's my father, Michael, aged about four. That's his grandfather, Tom de Gale. That's 1908, apparently. It says, I, oh, Granny's in it. I hadn't realized that. There's Olga, she was blown up in the war. The interesting thing is the mixture of colours. Mm. Wilhelmina looks very much more of a, an African origin, I think. Whether we went as a, an indentured slave or whether we went as an overseer, it's not at all clear. But anyway, we seem to have made good, as the Scots would say, and by the time we got to 1920, they had quite a lot of plantations. Victor, Victor left. 18 outside children by eight different coloured women and he married and had six legitimate children as well. Outside children? <laughs> it's what the, well, it's what you would call illegitimate in, in English parlance. <laughs> but the Grenadians call them outside children. Now, do you think it would have been a scandal for a white plantation owner and a black woman to have a child? No, not, out, not, in, not, in, not at all. It's perfectly normal. I've never got the impression it was a problem. I mean, uh, people in Grenada are all sorts of different colours. There were no white women in Grenada in the middle, of the early part of the 19th century, so there were, there were lots of black women. Yeah. So they were quite available. So you'd be descended from that couple? I would think so, yes, certainly. I've always felt the only place I've ever felt at home is Grenada, and I know when I get off the aeroplane. This is uh, house number, what, 30 odd? Uh, so, um, for my time in the army, <laughs> and uh, so we, we moved around an awful lot. You've uh, lived in 30 different houses? Yes. 
we went to our very first house in Folkestone and uh, we came back from honeymoon on the Sunday and on the Friday I was told that I was leaving for to go back to Aden immediately because of the crisis. Caught in the coils of South Arabian history, by 1965 these had become as big a basket of snakes as ever confronted any departing empire. In February 1966, the end of it all, totally and forever, Britain was on the way out. Looking back, my, my very first trip was when I was a second lieutenant, very, very newly commissioned from, from Sandhurst. And uh, I was invited to take out 120 jocks out to, to uh, Malaya. I was uh, just 20, but I was 19. So I found myself in the jungle with a platoon, and I'd never been in the jungle before. And with, luckily, Sergeant Tweedy at my elbow saying, look up page 29 of the pamphlet, sir, you'll see it's all right. And eventually we had the Medeca, which was the Malaysian independence. The people that one has worked with and been with uh, have become one's family in a way because the, the jocks do what they're asked to do and always do it superbly. It has been a privilege to, to command them and to be with them. The soldiers joined to serve the Queen and they joined to serve Great Britain. But you're English, aren't you? No, I was born in Glasgow. My accent may not sound Glaswegian, but uh, I was born in Glasgow and I was born, went to school in Glasgow and uh, left Glasgow to join the army. Well, I'm a member of the Royal Company of Archers, Queen's Bodyguard in Scotland, and we have the honour of looking after Her Majesty and guarding her when she pays her visits to, to Scotland. In a way, I'm still serving the Queen uh, and will go on doing so as, as long as I can. The sun was going down on Britain's empire, and at home the old class certainties were breaking down. The loss of overseas colonies and rising death duties had hit the upper class hard, and now the government had raised the top rate of tax to 98%. Britain was becoming more equal, and it was difficult to find working people willing to enter domestic service. Only 40 years ago, my grandfather was coming here with about 100 servants. Today, we struggle along with about four. Death duties have been the, the greatest curse of these days because they've crippled the estate forever. It's all gone. They want to equalize everybody on a, on a lower grade. As the distance between the social classes shrank and the upper class fell into relative decline, the few began to suffer. The Tenth Earl's original design for living had been built around huge households, but residents couldn't afford to keep servants anymore or run whole five-storey houses. The grand palaces were no longer fit for purpose, and the fewers were being forced to find new ways of making use of their vast spaces. I'll show you this, Joe. This is a, a storeroom. But look at the ceiling. Oh, it's the <laughs> Earl's ballroom again. I know. <laughs> that has to be the poshest ceiling for a cupboard I've ever seen. <laughs> I know. Why does it cut off like this? Well, it's when they split up this floor into a flat. There you are. Do you ever stand here and imagine what it must have been like when it was first built, when they would have balls in this room? Not really. No. No. The 10th Earl took possession of his new house in 1825. But within five years, he put it on the market as a potential hotel. 
It had needed an army of around 20 servants, and it was just too big for a townhouse, even for an earl. It was eventually sold, then split into five flats. By that stage, really, these houses were too big, even for a pretty affluent family. They needed huge numbers of servants to, um, to, to run the place. When the Earl of Murray sold his house,